Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here uh, this uh, early afternoon with all of you, and thank you so much uh, for your time. I know it has been, uh, it was a very short fuse for everybody this morning, but I really appreciate your presence, and I hope you find this uh, lecture uh, interesting and informative. Um, as mentioned by Kauther, the title of the presentation is The Interplay of Data Sciences uh, and Earth Observations for Environmental Challenges and uh, Early Warning Systems. Um, somebody always, like, you know, so, like whenever I give a presentation, they ask me about uh, my title uh, as a professor of Earth Systems Science. And people get uh, a bit confused about what do you mean by Earth Systems Science? Um, when we talk about our planet Earth, we know that our planet Earth is made up of what we call the different spheres. And by the term spheres, I'm referring to the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the biosphere, the lithosphere, the cryosphere. And all of these uh, compartments can be seen as a standalone compartments, but they are in quite uh, harmony with one another. There are a lot of interconnectivities between what happens in the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the biosphere, and so on and so forth. So whatever processes that are happening in the atmosphere are driven by and are driving other processes in the hydrosphere, and so on and so forth. So this animation is showing you the complexity of our system. And this is what we call the system of the systems. So the atmosphere by itself is a system. The hydrosphere by itself is a system. The lithu, the bio, the cryo, and so on and so forth. So we are trying to understand the processes which are shaping the interconnectivity between these different subsystems. So you can see here a lot of different processes which are happening uh, across our globe, on our planets, be it um, uh, tropical events happening over the ocean. You can see some kind of urban development. You can see some of the land processes, uh, different kind of uh, land use, land cover variability. Uh, you can see long range transport of uh, pollutants. Uh, and then you see different colors of these aerosols, which is also a representation of different origin, which might be of anthropogenic versus uh, natural origin. So we are able using satellites to discriminate between uh, sea salt and, 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 and dust. Uh, as well as black carbon and soot, sulfates, and so on and so forth. So, so Earth systems or the Earth system science is the understanding of these different processes which are shaping the planet uh, we are living uh, uh, in. Uh, and in order to do that, we are subdividing it into different kind of compartments. So there are different uh, interacting components, be it in the um, like related to the atmospheric composition, earth surface interior, water energy cycle, weather atmospheric dynamics, carbon cycle ecosystems, climate variability and change. So you can see these are different cores of the earth science or the earth system science. And we always say that earth system science, ESS, reveals the previously unseen planetary truth. There are a lot of facts about our planet that we are not able to observe. So when people are talking about forecasting or prediction of something, um, prediction or forecast doesn't come on empty grounds. Like you have to be aware of what has been happening in your past, what's happening right now in your present so that you are able to see what might be happening in the future. So it's a learning process. So when we are, like when people are referring to ML machine learning or AI, artificial intelligence, we need to work on our own intelligence first before asking the machines to be intelligent for us. So we, we, we use different kind of earth observations to train these machines, to train these models in order to be smart enough, to be educated, to be able to tell us what might be happening in the future, but uh, with, uh, with an acceptable level of skill and, um, and, uh, and truth. You don't want a lot of false positives. And moving in these directions is also accompanied by advancement in Earth system science, be it in technology, in different kinds of flights, research questions and analysis uh, accompanying it, and the massive uh, outbreaks that we are having in data and what we call uh, the curse of dimensionality. So we are living in a time where data is the new oil. So basically we have massive amount of data sets that we are uh, we need to drive meaningful information out of these data. So how you can really minimize data redundancy, but at the same time you maximize your variance within this data to be able to drive meaningful uh, information and apply it in different applications. And that's the beauty of Earth system science. 
when we talk about uh, environmental challenges and when we talk about uh, early warning systems, we need to be aware of what are the global risks uh, that humans are facing. According to the latest global risk report, which came out um, like, you know, the past few months, uh, early 2024, um, it, it, it came out already, like you know, it was published end of 2023, but it's the, the 2024 version, and it's always talking about the most depressing issues which are facing humanity. What are the most important global risks? And usually, like you know, on that list comes weapons of mass destruction as one of the top uh, um, um, risks facing humanity, but then followed by uh, a lot of number, like different areas, which are mainly environmental related. So you always talk about failure of climate system. You talk about loss of biodiversity. So in this chart in front of you, I'm showing you two axes. The vertical one is the impact, and the horizontal one is, um, uh, is, is the likelihood. So basically, I'm showing you the impact of the biggest events, and then what is the likelihood of their occurrence? How probable they are going to happen? And when you look on the very top right, the top right quadrant, which is representing for you the highest impact and the highest likelihood. So I'm showing you the most probable set of events that are going to happen and with the, with the highest impact uh, possible. And guess what? The majority of them in this green color are representing environmental issues, which are extreme weather events, natural disasters, biodiversity loss, failure of climate change adaptation strategies, and so on and so forth. So over the years, we have been talking about these global uh, uh, risk reports, and they are outlining for us different areas, be it economic, environmental, uh, geopolitical, societal, and technological, according to the different color schemes. But you can see over time the evolution of the environmental risks that we are facing as humanity. So we have, or we are facing, more and more unprecedented changes in our environment which are really of, uh, of, of a great uh, impact. And I'm going to be showing some cases today and, and how we can utilize Earth observations to address some of these uh, uh, systems. Uh, so these are some of the most extreme events and you can see their distribution across time and as well as uh, their, their frequency of occurrence. Some numbers again you can see coming on the top of the list Number one, extreme weather, 66% uh, of, of the risk cat categories, which is falling in this. And you can see also by the colors over the coming two years or over the coming 10 years, and you can see the colors also which are represent representing environmental uh, issues, be it extreme, critical change to earth systems, biodiversity, natural resource uh, uh, shortages. So these are very, very important issues which, in my opinion, are drivers for other risks. Like, you know, you can see some geopolitical risks, you can see some economical impacts, and so on and so forth. But the driver, the main initiator for these kind of system failures are stemming from uh, environmental uh, factors. Earth observations has been one of the most important tools addressing global agendas in general. Uh, the majority of you are aware of the Climate Paris Accord Agreement that happened in 2015, where the leaders of the world agreed on the iconic figure, which is the 2C, to be the ultimate figure that we should not be crossing by the end of the century. So it is expected that by 2100, 2000, uh, like 2100, we should not be exceeding a two degrees Celsius as a global temperature average. What I mean by that, I'm not saying that the, the whole plant is going to increase by 2C, no. Areas are going to be increasing by 4, 5, 6, 7 degrees. Others are going to be declining in their temperature. But we are talking about a 2 degrees Celsius as a global temperature average across space and across time. So this is what is meant by the 2C. Another, another uh, 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 global uh, agenda is the SDGs, uh, which is supposed to be checked in by the year 2030, where we, where we need to see how nations were able to achieve those uh, outlined uh, sustainable development goals by the UN, and the third, uh, which is the Disaster Risk Reduction Sunday uh, Framework. So these three major global agendas have been tackled, have been addressed, uh, by different tools. However, Earth observations uh, has been considered as one of the most uh, crucial uh, among, uh, among others. Uh, 17 goals, 169 targets, 232 indicators. These are the different kinds of issues that we need to deal with when it comes to SDGs. But uh, the, the, the table on the right-hand side is showing you specifically some 
drivers or some indicators which can be addressed using Earth observations. So here you can see specific numbers, 1.4.2. That's a specific indicator for the first uh, uh, su sustainable goal, which is no poverty. So you can address no poverty and you can assess the level of poverty in different nations based on some indicators. Among those are indicators which can be addressed using Earth observations. So, so that gives you uh, a very, like, it gives you an edge. It gives you a niche area where you are able to observe on a spatial domain and temporal domain. Because the beauty of Earth observations, it's able to give you a geo-intelligent view. So you can observe on a spatial area as well as across time. Uh, and that's, that's, this is how you can really, if you talk about foresight, this is how you really can build uh, a skillful foresight or uh, that, something that makes sense, which is stemming from uh, scientific research. And you can see across the different kind of goals, some of them, of course, are, uh, are higher than others. For instance, here, life on land, you can see number 15. You can see how many targets are addressed by Earth observations, and you can see how many indicators also can do that. Same thing here for number 10, uh, reduced inequalities. Like, you know, imagine that reduced inequality, how we can address uh, inequalities using Earth observations. So there are specific indicators that can be assessed using satellite observations, which is uh, considered to be something uh, massive. I'm going to be scanning, like skimming through some of the research work that we have been doing over the years, just to give you a flavor of how Earth observations can be uh, dealing with uh, issues uh, of importance. Uh, massive algal blooms, outbreaks, chlorophyll content, as you can see in this uh, in these images over the Red Sea, you can see this cyclonic behavior appearing in the water where it is showing you uh, HABs. If, if some of you are aware of uh, the harmful algal blooms, like, you know, high chlorophyll content. So we use different variables. We use something called mixed layer depth, uh, sea level height, uh, chlorophyll content, uh, uh, water color. So we use some kind of physical variables or indicators which can be assessed using satellites to address these issues. And you can see also some models here which are showing you different cyclonic behavior, like water eddies. Some of these ones you will see some uh, clockwise or counterclockwise. And imagine, like you can just try to, to figure this in your, in your head, uh, the water dynamics when it is clock or anti-clock, it's basically a proxy for upwelling or downwelling. So basically you are talking about nutrition cycle. You are talking about the contamination of uh, marine life or marine environment with any kind of uh, deposits in the water. So you are talking about fisheries, you are able to address marine habitats, you are able to address uh, nutrition distribution and so on and so forth. Uh, and this was some work that was done over, over this area. Uh, other work that we did uh, over um, uh, the mangroves in Jubail in, in uh, Saudi Arabia, where we were able to highlight some missing mangroves from the USGS uh, uh, websites. And actually this work was done uh, in collaboration with the Landsat science team. And we had like, you know, some really uh, good coverage from Landsat uh, science. Uh, acknowledging our paper that appeared also in uh, Bloomberg and uh, there was an article about that uh, and it got highlighted. Also, we, we, like using satellite observations, we were able to develop uh, the first dynamical solar atlas and for ICESCO and for some of its member states, uh, solar is one of the major wealth of energy that we are having. So for Egypt, we were able to develop the first dynamical solar atlas, which is considered to be the official document for the government right now for any kind of solar project investments. And this solar atlas is able to tell you how much solar irradiance you are able to capture over different areas. So basically, if you, are, if you want to initiate a solar project in a specific area, before you do any kind of, of business model, you need to be able to know how much solar irradiance is coming to this location so that you are able to take into account any impacts of dust or aerosols or any scattering so you have the actual amount of solar irradiance on the ground so that your business model is not broken. When you create a solar farm to develop 50 megawatts, uh, you are able to, to capture that so that your kilowatt hour um, uh, comes handy. Also, we did some work with the, on the Ethiopian Renaissance uh, Dam where we were able to observe uh, like different stages of development as well as uh, the impact on the water cycle. 
uh, other work done um, uh, in Saudi Arabia using drone technology where we are uh, highlighting the presence of baboons uh, in different places of, of the kingdom and in order to, to have some kind of remediation strategies for them, uh, we, we were using different kind of drone technology, training that on different models and then you have an ensemble model which can show you very, very low false positives and you are able to highlight their location so that you can have different kind of uh, remediation uh, strategies. This is how a dashboard looks for uh, Saudi Arabia, like you know where you have different uh, locations here, Al Baha, Jazan, Al Madina Al Munawwara, uh, Asir location, Mecca Al Mukarama, Mantaqat Nagran. All of these are different locations where you are able to dynamically like uh, locate yourself from one to another, and you are able to observe the land use, land cover in different uh, localities, and you see their percentage and distribution. Uh, imagine this applied on different member states where we want to map vegetation cover, map water objects, so that if you want to talk about long-term variability in droughts, combating desertification, so you have ways of uh, creating this kind of early uh, warning systems. Another example uh, on Juba. However, uh, we, like since, since the Paris Accord Agreement, uh, we have been talking about different scenarios of temperature increase, and this is what we call uh, the, the different warmer worlds. So, al-awalim al dafia like, you know, everything in the future is going to be warm no matter what. But, like, you know, we need to be aware of where we are going. There are some scenarios, like, you know, people are talking about the 1.5, which is far-fetched, but we are trying. The 2C is the most common. Three degrees and four degrees are, like, you know, are uh, disasters that we don't even want to talk about them. But look at this, like, you know, people who were born in 1960 versus people who were born in 2020. See their exposure to climate crises. See the difference in the, for, between these two different generations when they are exposed to fires, crop failure, droughts, sea level rise, and on top of all, heat waves. So when we look into the heat waves, generations born in 2020 has been exposed to a number of heat waves which are almost seven times more what others were born, were exposed to who were born in uh, 1960. So you can see the rate of exacerbation. Climate change is about acceleration. Climate change is about how fast the pace is moving. It's about the gradient. Like, you know, if your gradient is not very steep, we are okay, like, you know, if, if that, because the system is dynamical, like the planet is adjusting itself by itself, but if the, if the slope is not that steep. But since what we are observing right now is a very steep gradient, the rate of the acceleration is fast. Things are moving pretty, pretty fast, which can lead to some failures in our systems. Um, some of you might, might be more into research of climate change and what I'm showing you here are basically different scenarios, like, you know, what are the expectations of different uh, climate change scenarios. The most common right now that we are looking at is this which is telling us by the end of the century we might be reaching above 3 degrees Celsius. So the 2C is, uh, yeah, like I, 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 of course the 1.5 is far-fetched, it's not going to happen. Uh, the 2C uh, we are trying to limit emissions, we're trying to uh, make sure that we don't exceed that, but also it's not easy. Uh, so the most common scenario that's going to happen is um, around 3 degrees Celsius. And the science which is based on that is coming from here. Right now, in our climate system, this is what we have. 424 parts per million in terms of CO2 in our climate system. So right now, this is not a forecast. I'm giving you a number of what is currently present in our climate system, 424 parts per million of CO2. In order to reach three degrees Celsius, you need to have 538 parts per million by the year 2100. You can do the math. So in order to reach to one degree Celsius, we just wanted 421. So already our climate system increased by that degree, already. So like this is not a forecast now. I'm not telling you something that will happen. I'm telling you what already happened, that right now we already witnessed an increase by one degree Celsius. But there is another set of, of uh, indicators or another set of, uh, uh, of pathways 
or uh, projections or forecasts, but they do have a socioeconomic impact. So there are some other socioeconomic indicators which are also involved in this kind of assessment and more or less like the numbers are close, but these are different kind of indicators which are helping us to understand uh, what, uh, what might be happening uh, in the future. However, those natural disaster damages that you can see uh, in, in this map here can be even uh, uh, exacerbated by other actions which are um, like, you know, areas of unrest or areas where they have like a little bit of added component to the failure of the climate system. So you can see here countries which have uh, uh, like suffered large damages, but here also you can see the fragile and conflict affected states. They suffer four times more, like you can see, uh, like you know, for areas which are affected by conflicts, like you know, the impact can be um, even um, way, way higher. Global climate change is about finding solutions. Like, you know, it is not only about outlining the problems that we are facing, but we need to be aware of what might be happening now. And part of the mitigation or part of the adaptation strategies is to be able to uh, have early warning systems, which are able to tell you what might be happening in the future. A few years ago, Boris Johnson, the ex-Prime Minister of Great Britain, he, when he was like hosting the COP26 in Glasgow, he came to the public and he mentioned about cities which are going to be suffering from uh, uh, drowning over the coming few decades, like, you know, uh, areas which will suffer dramatically from extreme weather events. And he mentioned Alexandria in Egypt, my home city. And he said, like, you know, Alexandria is among those cities uh, together with Miami in, 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 in Florida, uh, Shanghai, uh, some other cities in Japan, Osaka in Japan, and others as well. And, and when he mentioned that, like, you know, a lot of people start uh, talking about the importance of having early warning systems there. This is among uh, the cities, according to The Guardian, and when they are mentioning, talking about the three-degree world, cities that will drown by global warming. Osaka, Japan, Shanghai in China, Miami in the US, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, as well as Alexandria in Egypt. So this is uh, some of the cities which are going to be uh, hit and affected the most. But, like, you know, over the years, like, you know, as a scientist, I have always the interest to talk about, like, you know, different kinds of natural disasters, and my research has been touching on that. Years ago, I have been talking about, like, you know, having um, um, extreme weather-related events over the Mediterranean basin, but nobody was, uh, like, believing something like this, how we can have events like this happening across the Mediterranean, and we are not uh, even prone to this uh, tropical-like uh, cyclones or events, until Libya tragedy happened, and that was uh, a wake-up call when it got hit by Storm Daniel. This is a Maxar um, image showing Libya pre-flood 2023, and this is after the, the fact. So you can see here the difference before and after, and you can see the power of Earth observations showing you the extent uh, uh, of the damage. So if we are talking about foresight, and if we are talking about looking into the future, uh, images like this built up over time, imagine that I have data like, you know, over the past 20 years or so, and I can show you the urban development in the member states. Like, you know, I can select the capitals of all the member states, and we can see the urban state of, 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 of the fact right now, how it looks, and then we can check how it looked a couple of years ago or 10 years ago. Then based on this kind of images, you can create a, a very smart model which can tell you the direction of the urban expansion. This is one of the tools that can be used. This is another image showing you the tragedy in, in Libya and some of the impacts that w has been happening uh, as a consequence of this uh, massive event before and after and some hydraulic modeling here. Uh, so what is the science behind that? We have witnessed, we have been studying the Mediterranean basin for the past few decades and we observed an increase in the sea surface temperature of the Mediterranean over the past 30 years by 2.5 degree Celsius. So there is an increase in the seawater temperature by two degrees over 30 years. Somebody might say, like, you know, why you are talking about uh, sea surface temperature, how this is important. Earth systems, we, we are not able to predict incidents. I just don't predict an event. I cannot come and tell you, like, you know, th this is a flood that's gonna happen. 
we predict processes. I predict the physical process which is leading for such an incident to take place. So what is the driver for this kind of cyclonic events happening over the Mediterranean? It comes from water. When the water is getting warmer, this is the physical process which can drive more and more evaporation from the water surface and it can create convective chimneys where you can end up having these different kinds of, of, of cyclonic uh, events. So this is what we predict. We predict the physical event itself and not, uh, and not uh, the, the incident. So here I'm showing you, like, you know, the formation of that hurricane or that uh, uh, cyclone over the Mediterranean basin uh, coming from, uh, like, you know, crossing Athens, going to different places in the East Mediterranean until it made a landfall over Libya and even it, may, it moved a little bit uh, towards, uh, towards Egypt. But to put things in perspective, when I was talking with some officials in Alexandria, I'm working with them to create uh, an early warning system there. Uh, so when I was talking to them to put things in perspective, in that day, Libya received around 240 millimeters of water in 24 hours. And just to give you uh, a better uh, flavor, 240 millimeters of rain is what Alexandria receives in one year. So basically, you are receiving the whole amount of water that you are supposed to be getting across the whole year in 24 hours. So the question is, are you ready? Are you prepared for such an instant? This is the power of early warning systems, where at least it can give you a 48 hours uh, um, like, you know, uh, alert system where at, at least people can evacuate. Like, you know, if we're not going to be saving uh, infrastructure, we are going to be saving lives. Some images like, you know, showing the history of some of these events. Um, like, you know, I'm going to wear my, uh, my academic hat. I apologize for that. I like data. I like numbers. Uh, bear with me. Like, this is going to be uh, short and sweet. So you can see here the global trend. What I'm showing you is just like, you know, sea surface temperature, the, the, the daily variability. But you can see the trend. You can see how the curve is going. But we don't look into global data. I want to remove what we call the seasonality. What happens every year, the norm, I want to remove it. I want to remove the normal so that I can look into the extremes. So what, is, what you are seeing right now is what we call de-seasonalization. So I'm removing the seasonal variability or the seasonal impact from these data sets so that what you are observing right now is, is only the anomaly like the change, the, be the extreme behavior. So you can see the trend of that kind of uh, anomalous behavior. You can see in a geospatial intelligent environment the change in the sea surface temperature over the basin. This is the power of Earth observations. It is a tool where we can use it in a geo-intelligent way. So I can, like, you know, we, we can have, like, you know, uh, uh, domains like that for member states where we can highlight a specific variable or a specific indicator. If I want to study some kind of expansion or impact on some environments, I can do that. This is a very iconic figure. This is a very, very important figure, and it's a representation of the anomalous behavior over the Mediterranean basin. And I just want you to look at the colors. The blue colors correspond to cooling events, and the horizontal axis is showing you the years, so from 1983 until recent. So you can see the blue colors are representing co cold water. The white color is the norm. No, normal. There is no change. This diagram is a representation of what we call anomaly. Anomalies are the deviation from the norm, be it positive or negative, extreme anomaly or uh, as a positive in the positive side or extreme anomaly in the negative side. So anything blue is cooling events. Anything white is the normal. Anything red is the extreme hot of the sea surface temperature of the Mediterranean waters. You can see in the 80s, Cool to normal, cool to normal. We, we hit 2000, start to have tinge of warming events. And then 2005, 2009, 2010, see the acceleration. This is what I'm talking about, the gradient, how fast. So what was happening before is happening now, but faster. And the magnitude is also increasing. So now we are looking into the increase in the magnitude as well as the increase in the frequency of the occurrence. 
and this is the, the notion of understanding how you, can need, how you need uh, an early warning uh, system. Uh, another representation of, of, uh, of this uh, cyclonic behavior showing you waters uh, in it, like you know, the amount of water embedded, the, the different colors correspond to amount of rain. So that when I'm, when I'm telling you there will be 200 millimeters of water coming, somebody might ask, how did you know we measure it? Like using the heat, heat capacities and uh, heat fluxes. These are some of the climate trends, like, you know, as you can see here, like some of the projections, models, and then what we do is to look into the future, what's going to happen by the year to 2080, 2100, uh, either by for sea surface temperature, for precipitation uh, anomalies, and so on and so forth. And this can be done, and we do that, like, you know, across uh, the globe, like, you know, different locations where you can have different kind of climate projections to understand what might be happening as a driving force, and then you can see the impact on different uh, sectors. Uh, but when it comes to modeling, like, you know, for a specific city or a specific member state, you need your models to be uh, customizable. You need your models to be more localized. You need high resolution models. Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, as well as Petri Talas, the Secretary General of the WMO, are talking about early warning systems. Fighting heat waves and other climate events emphasize our growing climate crisis. Closing the capacity on high quality early warning systems is essential to improve protection and build resilience. What we can think about here with our collective minds is, are we prepared for something like this? Our member states, do we have something like this? Do we have the capacity, do we have the capabilities of having effective, knowledgeable, skillful early warning systems which can make a difference? Petri Tala said early warning save lives and provide vast economic benefits. Because if you are investing in some area, in some location for like over the course of time, and you are not aware of what, what might be happening or might be hitting this domain, uh, you are not doing a good uh, uh, economic uh, judgment. Just 24 hours notice of an impeding uh, hazardous event can cut the issuing damage uh, by 30%. We can save lives and we can make a difference. And in order to do that, it comes, it needs a holistic approach where you combine observations with models and you deliver different kinds of products which can help decision makers and stakeholders to be better prepared and to be aware of how to deal with these different kinds uh, of events. But we are lacking in our regions with consistent regional coverage of weather data and this poses a huge risk for our climate resilience plans. We are not very well prepared because we lack a lot of observations. So uh, I can see a role for us to play here where we can be the custodians of uh, something like this, the initiative for something like this. And it's, it's happening across the spectrum, be it uh, for education purpose, for science and development, for culture heritage, for socioeconomic impacts. It, it, sp it spans on different kinds of sectors but we don't have the coverage we need. We don't have the data uh, we need. And this is what we need to do in order to achieve uh, such a capability in terms of observations, models, and products. And examples of these products can be what I'm showing you here, a geospatial intelligent solution, where I'm showing you global temperature anomaly mapper across the globe. And then I'm zooming in into different locations of interest. And here, in my case, I'm showing you over the Mediterranean. And you can see on the changing bar diagram in the bottom, changing from 1880 over then a century. This is how you can assess climate. When you have 100 plus years of data, this is how you can really have a good foresight. So you can see in this diagram here, changing at the bottom, towards the very end, all these red bar diagrams, all positive. This is similar to the accelerating behavior I showed you uh, a, a bit ago, like when I was telling you that the, the sea surface temperature is increasing more and more frequently. Here it is showing you over different locations of the Mediterranean, which is telling us, you know what, be ready. Like the north coast of Africa will witness a lot of these different kinds of tropical-like events, extreme weather events, which will cause massive amount of flooding and uh, destruction if we are not well prepared. Another solution, sea surface temperature, uh, like a, a model with it showing you on a spatial domain the changing temperature uh, that you can see here uh, over that location. Same thing applies for uh, chlorophyll and other, uh, other uh, variables. 
When I'm talking about models and their resolutions, this image is a very good uh, representation of what I mean. Imagine you're, you are having two different cameras with two different megapixels. The higher megapixel camera will give you much better uh, information as compared to the lower megapixel camera. You can see here on the left-hand side, 15 kilometer grid and the one, other one, 1 1.67 kilometer grid. Same event, same feature, same subsystem, but you can see the difference. This is what I'm talking about when it comes to high resolution numerical modeling. Not only that, but we are also talking about high resolution adaptive grid modeling. Look into the grid size. Now we are talking about like really advanced uh, science and technology here where you are looking into the grid itself and the grid size is minimized over the areas where you have the system developing. And this is very, very important because it reduces your computational power. I don't need to spend a lot of time and computation on the far edge of the event. I need more of my computation complex to be here. So that's, that's a reduction of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of computational time and of course of uh, computational power. The last couple of slides showing you also some of the radar images where they are highlighting areas of subsidence. So when we were studying Alexandria in Egypt and see the impact of sea level rise and the impact of, uh, of water into it, uh, not only that, we looked into areas which are suffering subsidence. So all the blue dots are areas where we have built up. Like, you know, you have more vertical expansion and all the red dots are showing land subsidence. These are radar images. And you can see here from this image, we created a new topography. We created a new digital elevation model, like based on Copernicus GLO 30 meters uh, DEM. And we highlighted here areas where are gonna be hit the most. Like, you know, these arrows I'm showing you are arrows for areas that the, the water is gonna be entering from there, and guess what? You have very, very low land. So you have salt water intrusion. Basically, the water is infiltrating from under the, the, the land and it's going into these urban areas. This is very, very important kind of work for decision makers. So now we are contributing effectively and actively toward decision makers and to, to, to local government. This is important. This work is under review right now uh, in the journal, The Science of the Total Environment, for those who are interested. Once it is uh, accepted, I will share with you. And this is a whole concept of having an early warning system uh, concept that we are aspiring to have, where you have a combination of high resolution modeling as well as different kind of observations. What are the attributes that I'm thinking of or dreaming about to have such a model? To be skillful and to be able to provide you with useful information. How decision makers are using the information to address risks and build greater resilience. In order to make such a decision which is gonna be economical decision, they need data. So they need to have scientific or driven, scientific driven uh, based evidence in order to make such a decision. What is the information being used for food, water, health planning development? Equal, equal emphasis on information to be skillful and useful. We don't want models which are gonna give you a lot of false positives. I don't want my model to tell you, oh, tomorrow there will be a flooding event and it doesn't happen. Oh, after tomorrow there will be another flooding event and it doesn't happen. Such models are not, are not effective. Such models are not good. You don't want something like this. You want skillful models. You want models with high confidence, above 70% and higher. You want very, very small numbers of false uh, positives. Uh, changing the user role from recipient to participant. The concept of co-design is very, very important. Whenever we are working in organizations or working uh, within teams, remember, we have stakeholders to deliver to. We, we are working like, you know, when I have a grant funded by NASA or funded by the National Science Foundation or the European Union, I know that there are expectations, there, there are program needs that needs to be met. So we need to have these stakeholders to participate with us in the co-design of our solution. And that's a very, very important concept, to change the role from just recipients to participants. And that makes a huge difference uh, through the lifetime or the whole ecosystem of, uh, of uh, uh, these uh, different kind of projects. We need to ensure sufficient resources, develop capacity and capability we be, to be able to evaluate uh, uh, information. So that's just like, you know, a brief, uh, a brief um, I would say, a brief journey.
like you know, in different parts of some of the research uh, that we have been uh, involved in. Uh, I hope I didn't take much of your time, and I hope it was not boring uh, for you, uh, and I'll be happy to take any of your questions, uh, if any. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Of course. I'm not sure. Okay, Dr. Rahil, you can say your question, and then I will repeat it. I, do we have a mic? Oh, they are available on the tables. Oh, I see. Okay. Thank you very much, first of all, uh, for a very nice presentation. Thanks. Uh, I have a couple of questions, you know. Uh, I, I know that data is very uh, robust as far as the CO2 emission is concerned from, especially in the industrial era and the rise of temperature and all that is concerned. The data is robust. I, I do not disagree with that. Uh, but, you know, uh, what we have seen in the past history of this planet, we have seen multiple glaciation Excellent. events. Agreed. And each glaciation event is preceded by a rise of three degrees Absolutely. Celsius in temperature. Absolutely. And right now, the last glaciation event happened about 25,000 years ago. Perfect. And we are in the inter, uh, interglacial uh, event in the ha Holocene. And uh, do you think, you know, this rise in temperature that we are seeing uh, is not uh, another event, natural cycle. Uh, not a natural cycle, rather than a man-created cycle. And uh, if so, you know, uh, uh, should we really worry about it? Uh, because the next uh, glacial event seems to be right around the corner, uh, looking at the rise of the event, uh, temperature and all that. Second question. Uh, I'll sit down now. Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, you talked about extreme weather events, and we know that extreme weather events uh, uh, fall in the 10th percentile of a probability density function, which means that uh, the pr uh, predictive capacity of extreme uh, uh, weather events is very, very low. Absolutely. And uh, you also talked about 48 uh, hours uh, uh, head start on that. You know, really, uh, 48 hours is really not enough to evacuate a large city, and it will create gridlocks and a lot of problems and all that. So can we not really, uh, uh, in the light of that, even if we predict 48 hours before, you know, using RSGS technology or whatever, uh, how, uh, you know, how effective or how good is it really uh, to prevent uh, massive death tolls and all that? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rahil. Uh, these are two amazing questions. Uh, and again, like you know, I'm an academic. So, uh, and academics, you know, they love to talk and they love to explain and present. But I'm going to try to make it very short. You have a very good point. And let me tell you something. Across decades and across centuries and hundreds and thousands and millions of years, it has been witnessed and we observed this different kind of cycles. And let me add to, it, to you that we already witnessed an increase to the 2C and the comeback. As you mentioned before, every single pre-industrial revolution, we saw, we saw that. In the, in, in the glacial and the interglacial periods, we know that. And as you know, like before every single kind of glaciation, what happens? A big volcanic eruption. So a ma massive volcanic eruption, end of time, then you have glaciation periods like you know, for, for years and years, and then another civilization starts. I agree with all of that. But let me add back to you. At no point in the climate record, in the paleoclimate, rings from trees, core samples, at no point ever, the CO2 concentration in our climate system exceeded 200 part per million. So whenever there was a natural cycle, and I'm telling you, the 2C, already we observed it. We saw that. We saw the temperature increasing to the 2 degrees Celsius and coming back again as a natural cycle. But at no point whatsoever, the CO2 exceeded 200 parts per million over those millions of years. You know, the Atlantic Ocean, its age is 180 million years. That's the age of the Atlantic Ocean. It took 180 million years for the, for the continents to separate, from Africa to separate, from South America, the Gondwana land and Eurasia and all of that, like these tec tec uh, tectonic mo movements. At, across all this time, no time, CO2 exceeded 200 parts per million. We are only observing the, the increase in the CO2 right now in the pre-industrial revolution and the industrial revolution. This is the only time where it is exceeding 300, 400 right now. So that's why we believe we are 
uh, nothing is absolute in life, but we are above 90 something percent sure that there is an anthropogenic component into the cycle that we are observing. So I know, like, you know, if we talk about the Cambrian, the pre Cambrian, the Holocene, the Miocene, all of these geological times, right now we are in a different era. Um, there is even a name for it that is not uh, coming to my mind right now. Uh, that's for your first point. The second one, do you remember here, King Katrina, what happened in New Orleans? In the U.S., one of the one of the biggest, like you know, industrialized nations uh, in the world, Hurricane Katrina killed hundreds of th thousands of people. Why? Because the early warning system was not effective enough to tell them where the hurricane is going to make a landfall. The hurricane deviated its pathway. It gave a, an, an alarm 24 hours ahead of time, but it gave an alarm for the wrong place. So evacuation didn't happen. To be honest with you, 48 hours is way better than nothing. The tsunami that happened in Sumatra, they got an alert from India three minutes before the hit of the tsunami. There was a warning that was issued to them three minutes, but of course people couldn't do anything in three minutes. But 24 hours or 48 hours can save thousands of lives. It can make a huge difference. Uh, the fact that these kind of events are quite rare, I agree with you, the probability. But however, you would see nations are having 100-year flood models and 1,000-year flood. So it doesn't happen. You are prepared for something that should not happen. But you are prepared. You know why? Because you can get your economic development. You can get your enterprises. You can get your urban expansion. You can do whatever you want in areas over hundreds of, uh, over tens of years, over 30, 40, 50 years, over five, six, ten decades. And then all of a sudden you just get one event which can wipe your investment for the past hundred years. So, so that's why, although, like, you know, these events are quite rare, but we witnessed in our lifetime, Sumatra, tsunami Japan, Libya, New Orleans, floods in, in New York, and so on and so forth. So these events are extreme, and when they hit, they hit hard. Yes, Dr. Sir. Bismillah <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Hisham, for your, your uh, Thanks, profound Dr. and valuable presentation that opened to us the gates of understanding how climate change can affect our life. Uh, my question is, we, uh, first we work together to uh, establish an initiative regarding the monitoring, how, uh, monitoring the, uh, the impact of climate change on heritage sites on the Islamic world. My question is, how can we use remote, remote sensing and AI to create a, an early warning system to uh, protect the disasters and uh, catastrophe of the Islamic world. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much, Dr. for your question. AI is nothing but a tool that we train. So, and, and excuse me for the term, like we say garbage in, garbage out. So if I put garbage into the system, uh, like if I feed it with garbage, it's gonna give me garbage. So you have to be very sure about what you are feeding your system. AI is not a miracle, it's not magic. It is just a tool, it's a very smart way of getting meaningful information but based on what you are feeding your models. So the, the rule of thumb is always based on quality of data. What kind of data you are feeding to your models? What kind of indicators? And this is where, where science plays a role. Like we have to be smart about outlining our indicators and using what kind of indicators that we want to use in order to assess uh, the impacts on different kind of heritage sites. So once we have a way of looking into what will be the impacts on these sites, then we can decide and design some kind of metric or indicators that can be assessed and measured quantitatively, and then we have a record of these indicators. We have data for them. We get this data and we feed it to our different kind of models, deep learning models and, and AI models, so that you can uh, forecast and expect and anticipate what might be happening for the future of this uh, Hertz site. So it's, it's just based on how you are, um, how you are um, uh, how you are able to address the current risks, how you are able to observe them, how you are able to document them quantitatively. And I keep repeating the word quantitatively because it needs to be science-driven and data-driven. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for this interesting uh, lecture. Actually, uh, uh, we all know that the early warning systems is based on uh, data, you know, either historical data or 
data that collected from different uh, sources or even uh, data collection systems. Uh, uh, now the problem that, you know, uh, predicting something should be done based on analyzing these data, looking for different variants, either manually or automatically, artificial intelligence or whatever. But how, how can we guarantee that the data that we feed to do this manual or automatic system is uh, a real, I mean, it's, it's not poisoned uh, by, uh, uh, you know, uh, either intentionally or unintentionally, or how can we uh, guarantee the authenticity of, of, uh, of the data that feeding the system, you know? As you just mentioned, garbage in will get garbage out. So if the data is changed or played, but our data, it's not accurate. The prediction will be uh, far from uh, accurate. Yeah, I, I cannot agree more, uh, more uh, with you. Uh, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm referring to uh, Earth observations, like satellite observations, satellite data, which cannot be uh, manipulated or cannot be uh, maneuvered. You don't have access to, uh, like you, you, you can do errors in, in, in analyzing your data but you cannot uh, falsify your data because it's data observed by, uh, by, by systems and by machines which have been validated by scientific communities. And, and these different kinds of projects are uh, billion dollar projects and uh, the, the room of error is, is close to, uh, to null. Um, so, so that's why, like, you know, Earth observations is one of the very, very important tools. However, we always look for what we call ground validation. So if I have a system right now, flying system, and this system is looking into atmospheric variables, I need some sun photometers on the ground to do data calibration. We do that. The problem will be that you don't have enough ground observations or ground systems scattered across the globe in all places. And that's a problem. You don't have coverage. Like in, uh, in our parts of the world, unfortunately, I can show you maps where you can see massive gaps in data. In like you know northern Africa in the MENA region, maybe some member states here, like you will see gaps in data. When when you are running climate models, you have gaps in your models because of the lack of data in some of these locations, and that's a problem. But what do we do? We we try to advocate for it. We try to talk about it more and more. We show the uh, we show the importance of Earth observations and what kind of tools it provides you, so that you can try to figure out a way of having corresponding systems on the ground to do data validation. But at the end of the day, like data coming from satellites are, uh, are quite accurate to be used and the room of error there is, is almost like, is almost none. Um, so that's, that's what, what we do in our, uh, in our field. Um, when you have ground measurements and you have systems which are not calibrated, um, sometimes they are on, sometimes they are out, they get dislocated, you move it from one location to another without recalibration to a new location. All of these are, are, are human errors, which of course affect uh, the data integrity and data quality, but this, is, this can be overcome by data cleaning methodologies as well, which, which is quite evident. Um, the, the problem is much bigger than like, you know, we are questioning the integrity of these data. Our problem is the lack of data in some areas, and, like, and the redundancy of data in other areas. Yes, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Hisham. It, is, uh, it was a very interesting lecture. Uh, my question is uh, how we position ICISCO to all of this in terms of uh, your recommendations uh, for the sectors, uh, whether be it in research, whether be it in uh, certain activities, we want to see the, your foresight for the future. Thank you. Th thank, thank you so much. That's, uh, that's a very good uh, point. Um, and uh, to be honest with you, uh, for me, I, I look into trajectories. And uh, it is quite clear, quite obvious for anybody to observe the change that ICESCO has been uh, observing over the, um, over the most recent years. You can see um, the trend of the change. You can see the trend of the presence. You can see the trend of the activities which are being conducted. And also when you engage in conversations with the leaders uh, in, the, in the organization, you can feel and you can see um, how, how the visions are 
uh, being implemented and, uh, and how each sector, each department is working to achieve excellence in whatever they are doing. This is evident. This is very clear for anybody, either an insider or an outsider. But when you talk about the future, you have to set for yourself a purpose and you have to highlight some kind of priorities that you want to, to, to achieve. And based on the priorities that you are setting for yourself, either as a, a sector, a department, uh, or a, a whole organization, based on your priorities, you are going to establish your, your pillars. Um, what do we need? Like, you know, do we need uh, resources in, 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 in this sector for, which is reflected in manpower or a different thought process or whatever? So based on the purpose that you are having, the vision that you are having, and the priorities, and the pillars established based on all of that, then you can see what might be happening in the future. And based on my discussion and based on my presence over the past uh, 72 hours plus, uh, what I see that the vision is uh, to be a hub, to be a custodian, to be uh, a leader for, for that region, for these member states, uh, in terms of innovation, in terms of uh, action with skill, or to be able to think like you know ahead of time, to be prepared for things uh, to happen. Whether uh, be it what are the new skills of the future, what should be like you know the educational purpose that we are going to be looking into the future, what's going to be the different kind of socio-economic impacts that we are going to be seeing, which sectors, which departments, which states are going to be affected in what over when. All of these are drivers for your. Uh, strategic goals or our drivers for whatever you are going to be planning uh, for the near, the middle, and the far future. In my opinion, and based on my conversations, the vision of innovation is very, very important because we are living right now in a very dynamical world. We are living in, uh, we, we, we are experiencing dealing with Gen Z, totally different generation from uh, like, you know, what, what was the expectation? The way I was trained or educated is different from the way Dr. Rahil was educated is different from how my son, how my daughter are being educated now. The, 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 the level of the information is different. The, the different dynamics in classrooms are different. The educational pedagogies are different. Now we have different kind of dynamics. We have flipped classrooms. We have um, like, you know, students as professors like who are giving the lectures instead of their professors. We have AI, which is also leading tasks and things of that sort. Like, you know, some of the tasks that I give my students in my classrooms is to, diff to compare between different kind of uh, uh, AI models how to answer these questions and to understand what's behind that to see like you know NLP natural language processing how it is uh, performing uh, something uh, for that sector versus other sector how we can use AI in finances how we can use AI in economics how we can use AI in marketing how we can use AI in branding so a lot of things are changing around us right now which requires us to think in a dynamical way and, and innovation as, as a slogan for ICESCO, I think, in my opinion, is a great target, is a great, uh, sorry, I'll take this back, not target, it's a way, it's a mean to achieve something bigger. So I don't want, uh, like, you know, technology or AI to just to be the goal, no. For, for me, it's just nothing but a tool that I should be using wisely and, uh, and uh, in a smart way. Uh, when it comes to um, like when it comes to the environment, which is something dear and uh, close to my heart, uh, I'm aware of major problems across the, the region in the, in our member states. Uh, I know ICESCO can be a leader in these areas. Like you know, it can be the place where member states can look at ICESCO as the think tank. Like you know, the 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 go to house, the house of experts, the house of uh, consultations, the house of uh, leading projects and initiatives to address such a problem because these problems, believe it or not, are of geospatial importance. Like I cannot deal with the Mediterranean problem in Libya without dealing it with, uh, with it in Egypt, without addressing it in Tunisia and Morocco. We all share the same Mediterranean. What's going to happen over the Mediterranean in the East Mediterranean will happen somewhere else also in the Mediterranean. See, So this kind of complementarity relationship will be driven and can be adopted by 
such an organization because we have the voice, we have the power, we have the tools, uh, and we just need the resources. And when you are able to offer the solution to your custodians or so to your stakeholders as a custodian, you can get the resources. Trust me, getting the resources is the most easy thing. For me, I never had a problem to get money. My problem always how to spend money, but how to spend it in, in the correct way and how to deliver and how to, to make use in the most effective way, because I deal with federal money. Like the money I get from funding agencies is federal money. So if I don't follow like, like by heart what's, what's, how it is being spent and how it's being used, I'm going to be in big trouble. So, so getting money is not a problem. It has never been a problem. Um, finding the ideas, like the innovation in your ideas, this is the, the hard task. Then getting the money for it is easy. Um, this is just my two cents. I hope I addressed your question. Yes, Kaufer, I remember. Hello again. Hi, how are you? I actually have two questions. Sure. Um, human beings tend to actually uh, forget that Mother Earth is not something uh, forever lasting. And uh, uh, so uh, on your experience, on, on, on your opinion, how can we make humans in general realize that it is not, uh, it's actually the, the climate change and the situation on Earth is going from uh, bad to worse. This is number one. Number two, uh, you were talking about like systems to um, help predict uh, uh, catastrophes or uh, stuff like that. So um, for example, let's say right now we have uh, an alert and we need actually to evacuate the places. Uh, we don't have actually trainings for human beings, let's say uh, people, to actually know what to do in such, in such situations. So do you think that uh, is there a way to include these kind of trainings in education systems or in workshops or, or, um, or other uh, activities like that? Thank you so much. Uh, two great questions and thank you so much for uh, your uh, very thoughtful questions. Uh, yes, humans tend to forget. And this is why in some of the literature you will see like books which are talking about natural disasters. They refer to the places where people choose to live in. And this is not my quote so that nobody gets offended. They call it the idiot zones. We, we, we as humans, we live in the idiot zones. And again, no offense to anybody. But we tend to live in flush flo flood plains. We live in areas across the ocean where you are in the middle of a mountain suffering massive erosion and you see like the oxides all around you and it is very likely that there will be a land collapse happening in these locations. People live in the middle of forests and you have wildfires all around you. And when your house gets burned down, guess what? They rebuild it again in the same location. So humans tend to forget, that's absolutely. But this is where it comes our role as scientists. And scientists are not doing a good job, like, and I'm including myself in this. Because scientists, sometimes they, we live in our silos and we live in our worlds and we are not able to communicate effectively. And this is where the bridging is needed. Like this is where the complementarity relationship between different sectors is a must. I cannot work as a scientist independent from uh, Socio, uh, like you know, uh, socio-economic impacts, or so, like you know, socio uh, or human uh, human impacts. Uh, like this kind of strategic marketing is very, very important. We have to be working hand in hand so that we have the right ways, the right tools for communicating the science effectively. Like you know, today I had a meeting in the morning with uh, one of our colleagues here, and he showed me uh, some of their products from their uh, sector, a comic book. Uh, like, you know, as one of their products. And for me, that was like a brilliant idea. Like, you know, it's like he knows what kind of audience he might be reaching to. And such a mean of communicating the information is effective. Like, I will, I will not take this lightly or I will not like laugh at it or like take it. Uh, no, that's a good way of communicating the information. Um, being prepared to do this evacuation, I agree with you. Like, you know, we might not be that ready yet. But why? Because we are not educated. And this is also a shortage, in a, a gap in the system. I, SESCO, as a leader in this, as a hub for 43 member states, can easily play this kind of role. You can easily have a regional hub 
where you are communicating this like educational materials across nations. You are able to be the actual liaison between different entities. You might see Azerbaijan is pretty advanced in something which is really lacking in Egypt. So you can be the person, you can be the mediator where you are collecting this information, having it in a centralized location, and then start to share the same information across member states. So you are going to be an effective and vital player in this, in this way. Education, educating our communities is very, very important. And we are not collectively, we are not doing a good job yet. We are very occupied in our day-to-day -day business, but we need to be also looking a little bit to the future and see what is needed for, uh, for these communities. So uh, uh, being able to just give a, a hint or to help people to evacuate or tell them to evacuate is far better than just leaving them in the dark side and people would just lose their lives. Uh, in Florida, like you know, when they are evacuating, you see a lot of our car accidents on the freeways. But again, like you know, you are saving thousands of lives. It's a huge difference. Like you know, you don't want to have a catastrophe like what happened in Libya. Like the official numbers which were shared is like 10, 15 uh, thousand people uh, got killed, and the actual numbers from the ground is more than that. It's like you know. I have numbers which are above 30,000 30, people lost their lives in this instance, yeah. So we are talking about events which can be quite devastating. Um, I, I think, I see right now, ICESCO is positioned in a very unique position, uh, very capable, um, amazing uh, team, um, like, uh, like very, very uh, visionary leadership, um, and I don't see why uh, why it should be the hidden gym. There is no point for us to hide. Like, you know, we want to brag. So maybe, maybe this is the time where everybody needs to start thinking about, uh, like, you know, how to move into this uh, uh, innovation and be, um, uh, like, you know, be a sound and, and have uh, effective means of, of helping your member states. Okay. Uh, I took a lot of time, and uh, I really appreciate your presence. Do, oh, please. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Thank you so much, Dr. Laskari, for this wonderful presentation. I'm truly impressed and amazed. I have no understanding of the data behind everything that you said, but I, I get the, the gist of everything. Thank you so much. So thank it. you. Um, I just joined ISESCO in the education sector. My Great. Name is Maria welcome Delby. on board. Thank you very much. Um, I am... Uh, Learning also about you know the the links between Islam and and science, Islam and education and culture. And my understanding uh, from our religion is that one of the five purposes of creation is stewardship, istikhlaf, and that God Subhanahu wa Taala created us with a divine understanding of how to take care of our earth. Mm. My concern is that in our generation, the Generation Z that you uh, mentioned, um, which is a generation of, of heavy consumers of information and a lack of, with a lack of uh, critical thinking in a lot of domains, is also a generation that is feeling extremely guilty and anxious every single day about this prospect of an absolutely glim and, and, and horrible future for Earth. How can we frame the presentations that we have around climate change in a way that empowers humans to feel that they actually have the answers within them um, about how to take care of Earth and how to be the stewards of Earth that God gave us the talent to do naturally? Thank you. Um, great question, and thank you so much for your also very thoughtful. I think uh, um, ISIS was doing a great job recruiting uh, their uh, new members and congrats on joining uh, ISESCO. Uh, I'm not gonna claim that I'm an Islamic scholar because I'm not. Uh, and uh, I have like, you know, modest understanding like like majority of Muslims, but uh, Alhamdulillah, I agree with you. Um, like, you know, Islam taught us how to take care of our environment and how to act um, as um, like, you know, uh, humans with the mentality of stewardship towards our environment and towards the, 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 the beneficial use of our resources, which we are not doing. Um, and I also agree with you that uh, the future might be 
uh, seeming uh, like, you know, for the new generation, like, you know, that uh, we are doomed, like, you know, there is no, absolutely no hope. And this is far from truth. Like, you know, subhanAllah, God created this planet to accommodate itself by itself. It doesn't need us. We need it. Like, you know, there is absolutely, we are nothing, like, you know, in, as, as part of that whole uh, system of systems. Like, you know, we are just one glimpse of the biogeochemical cycle. We just contribute some CO2 to the, to the atmosphere. That's it. The population increase that we are witnessing right now is going to affect nobody but us because you are not going to have enough resources, enough water, enough food, enough of everything. But subhanAllah, there is uh, also a natural cycle of recycling. Like, you know, the COVID was a recycling process. Uh, like these different kind of events are nothing but a recycling process. Uh, where like people who are uh, with good health, is, uh, they survived. People who are not, they did not survive. Like, you know, this is an act of God. Like, you know, nobody interfered in that. But, but science is showing us ways and hopes. Like, you know, I don't like to put science in a way that science is making us more demoralized, which is not true. So, like, what I'm showing you here is not to make you feel bad. It's to make you feel capable. Like, you know, we are able to develop these different kind of early warning systems which can save lives. So we are able, we are capable of doing that because, uh, like, God give us brains that we are used. Sometimes we can use it to the worst of ourselves, and sometimes we can use it to our benefits as well. Um, I see what's happening to our new generation is something different. Uh, people get distracted. Like, you know, there are a lot of things around them which are even pushing kids away from education systems. Like, you know, I can bet you, you can uh, talk with 10 individuals who are right now college students, and I can tell you, like, these 10, nine of them or eight of them will not even be interested in earning their education or getting their college degree. They would be very happy if they have a certain number of TikTok followers or a certain number of social media followers and they can make money because you know why? Because the venues that they are using, these different kinds of apps, these different kinds of tools are showing them that others are making money with no effort. And as much as I like Bill Gates and what he did to the generation Stephen Jobs and all of these people, I hate the fact that they are calling themselves they are school, college dropouts or school dropouts. So everybody now thinks that, oh, it is okay to drop college or to drop education and I'm going to be able to make money. It doesn't work like this. No, you will not be able to make money. Like, you know, the conventional way, the conventional methodology that we are all following, like, you know, going through education is the only normal way. Like, those different kinds of outliers are just nothing but outliers. So, in my opinion, these platforms, these tools, which are giving the message to these generations about, like, you know, this different kind of gloomy future, we can utilize these tools. Imagine that ISISCO have their own TikTok channel or like you know your Facebook channel, or different kind of uh, social media outlets where you are reaching different kind of generations in your member states. And imagine instead of like you know giving them uh, like you know some, some false information coming from different outlets, we are giving them scientific bites. And we are calling them bites, like no more than 30 seconds or one minute. Like you know, educational bites. Um, like, you know, snackables. Uh, they are calling them education snackables, like snacks. So these are, like, you know, how we can utilize the current platforms, the current tools that we are observing to the benefit of our generations in our member states. And if we are able to succeed in a very, very small uh, localized um, I wouldn't say case study, but um, like, you know, uh, a small pilot, pilot, a small pilot. If you, if you are able to do that, you can upscale. And trust me, like, you know, a project like this, you are gonna get massive support for it. Um, it is our role as educators, as scientists, as uh, people who care about the environment, care about, like, you know, the uh, socioeconomic standards, care about our culture and our heritage, to showcase this by action, and our action should be translated to things on the ground so that we can help those future generations. And, and again, thank you for your question. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hasham. 
My name is Vakas, and I've also recently joined ISSCO. Great. Uh, well, thank you very much for such a, a nice and informative presentation. Uh, uh, um, as we know that in uh, the climate change subject, we have a lot of challenges in areas that we uh, think of, and there's a lot of research happening as well. But you being the subject expert, uh, how do you see that what should be the top three most important research questions and research areas that the low and middle income countries and ISSCO should be working on for uh, avoiding the climate calamities uh, and to work in the resilience uh, sector? Thank you. Wow, okay. That's, uh, that's an amazing question and you got me thinking now. Uh, yeah, that's a very, very deep question and very good. Like for me to highlight the most important three things that ISESCO should be uh, talk about for uh, our member states. Uh, this year, uh, okay, in 2022, uh, there was the COP meeting, uh, the Committee of Parties about Climate Change in, in Sharm el Sheikh. 2023, it took place in Dubai. 2024, it's happening in Azerbaijan. 2024, there is another COP on desertification happening in Riyadh. So in three consecutive years, you have four COPs, and 2022, there was a COP in biodiversity in Egypt. So basically in four years or so, you had more than six UN big events about climate desertification, biodiversity in the Islamic world, in the member states. That's a message. That's a very clear message. Desertification is one of the most important issues that humans are gonna be suffering from in the future. Lack of food, food security, lack of food resources is gonna be among uh, top priorities for uh, a lot of nations. Water security is on top of all. The future wars, and quote me on that, will be wars over water. And I don't have to tell you about the future. Look what, what's happening right now. Right now, and I'm not, uh, I'm not into politics, and I'm not going to deviate into politics, but I can tell you that uh, Diglis and Euphrates, uh, Tigris and Euphrates in Iraq, uh, like water shortage dams in, 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 in Turkey. Uh, Golan, it's, it's a water issue. Uh, River Nile, it's a water issue. So you can see like geopolitics or different kind of issues across, um, across the globe are driven by resources, natural resources. Let me tell you something, and uh, we might have some historians here or people who can check this piece of information. The French Revolution, like you, know, you remember, like the French Revolution when it happened, it was uh, uh, ra rallying against the current regimes back then. But let me tell you something, the French Revolution started, it was triggered by a volcanic eruption that took place seven years before the outbreak of the French Revolution. Check this piece of information, like look into the historical records. Seven years before a volcanic eruption happened, which wiped out areas. It caused massive shortage in food chains and food productivity. A lot of people start to, to really suffer from lack of resources, and that caused the political uprise. So food security, water security, desertification, for me are issues which are very, very important for the member states. And it is not scientific issues by far. And let me, let me take you back here very briefly, very quickly, since I have the presentation still out there, um, you, you are gonna be surprised to see this. When I showed you this diagram here, do you see this? Um, the, uh, when I told you about the uh, global risks, the primary global risks, the green one is extreme weather events. This green is failure of climate change. This green is natural disasters. This red is water crises, but it is red. Look in this slide, what is the red? Societal. Water crises is not an environmental problem. It is a societal problem. So I'm not referring to issues which are of scientific basis or only like related to for science sector. By far, no. This is an issue for education, for society, for heritage, for culture, for everybody. So these for me are the most depressing issues as uh, um, um, an earth scientist 
uh, that I care a lot about. And these are the kind of research projects that I'm working on right now. Actually, we just had a paper published a uh, couple of days ago in Stoughton uh, about water resources in Texas. Uh, and I just linked to, uh, to my uh, LinkedIn profile. If anybody is interested, it is on my LinkedIn profile. Uh, I hope I addressed your question. Thank you. Okay, actually, I'm really surprised that people are still here and asking questions. I, I really appreciate that. And uh, I'm also respectful and mindful to your time. So I'm, I'm done whenever you are done. So feel free to, I know people are busy, uh, but um, again, I enjoyed my presence with you. Thank you so much uh, for your attention. And uh, if we don't have any further questions, uh, yeah, I would like to thank you all and um, I'll see you around. Thank you.